Hi. In this video, I'd like to introduce you to the components of connective tissues, namely cells and the extracellular matrix that these cells will maintain or produce and maintain. Uh, now, when we talk about connective tissues, we're actually talking about a wide variety of different uh, mixtures of um, fibers and cell types, or at least ECM and cell types. And by ECM, I'm talking about extra cellular matrix. Sometimes just referred to simply as matrix. So now these connective tissues are composed of this these different ECM components uh, which are divided into fibers and something called ground substance. We'll talk about that shortly. Okay. And then there's also the cells which produce and maintain that ECM. Okay. Now, the uh, different types of tissues are categorized as connective tissues based on the fact that the ECM is actually the main component of the tissue. Okay. So basically, uh, connective tissue is a very large category of things. Um, and basically, a lot of different tissues, as long as they have meet this main characteristic where the ECM is the more abundant component compared to the cells, they fall into this category. So uh, we will actually be looking at connective tissues for the next few weeks, um, but today we're going to, or this week, we're going to be simply focusing on some of the more, um, more standard or more basic ones. Okay. Uh, so again, it's a connective tissue as long as we have more ECM than cells. And the thing to note here also is that the cells are not usually connected to one another. Okay. Um, so as you might remember from our epithelium section, you saw that the cells were connected in sheets. They were connected with one another and made continuous sheets. Uh, you will also notice when we talk about muscle later on that muscle cells are also connected to one another. Okay. And that is one of the things that really differs or, or, or separates them from connective tissues, is that connective tissue, uh, the cells are not necessarily connected to each other. They can be quite far apart. Uh, and again, the, the extracellular matrix is really the main component. And its composition, the, the ratios of fibers to ground substance and the types of fibers that are found there is going to determine the kind of functions that these tissues actually are able to perform. So let's take a look at the um, matrix components first, and then we'll talk about cells. So as I mentioned earlier, uh, the, the ECM is divided up into fibers and ground substance. And so when we talk about fibers, we're mainly talking about collagen. Okay? So um, collagen fibers, reticular fibers, and elastic fibers are the fibers that we're generally talking about when we talk about the matrix fibers. And when you talk about collagen, really we're talking about something that um, is actually a fairly wide variety of different things. Uh, but we generally uh, tend to focus on type 1 collagen, which is the most common type of collagen you're going to find. Uh, type 2 collagen, which is generally just found in cartilage. So when we talk about cartilage, we'll be talking about type 2 cartilage. And then there's also type 3 cartilage, which is its own category. Uh, this is the reticular fibers that I just mentioned. Okay, so. Uh, that quite often is given its own separate category. And those are the three main ones that we find in connective tissues. Um, type 4 collagen, we guys have already seen in basement membranes when we talked about, connect, uh, about epithelium. The basement membranes of epithelia will contain type 4 collagen. Okay. Now, when we talk about collagen, it's useful to think of it in terms of a few different things. Type 1 and type 2 collagen tend to form these very tough sort of long fibers, which I tend to equate with things like rope. Okay. Now, collagens are made, uh, made up from subunits called tropocollagen. And tropocollagen is a triple helix of subunits uh, which can um, come together in different combinations, which is why we have 20 different types. Um, but the tropocollagen subunits are cross-linked with one another. There are covalent bonds linking them together. 
Uh, actually, vitamin C is very uh, important in forming those uh, those covalent bonds and, and cross-linking them. And so the more cross-linked tropocollagen molecules you have, the thicker this rope becomes, and the thicker the rope, the tougher the collagen fiber. Okay, And so type 1 collagen especially tends to form this kind of a very tough sort of rope that has very high tensile strength. So tensile strength. Which basically means that if you pull on the ends of it, it will resist that tension. Okay, but it is quite flexible still. Okay, so it's like a rope, very much. It's it's flexible. It can be coiled. It can be moved around. It can be bent. But if you pull on it, it's going to resist that tension. Okay, so again, type one especially, uh, you can think of type one collagen as very much like a rope. Type two is uh, very similar in in how it's arranged as well. Um, when we think about reticular fibers, um, it's more of a very fine and delicate network of things. So the cross, uh, the, the the collagen molecules there are cross-linked in such a way to form a, a network, not so much a rope, but something that looks more like a three-dimensional mesh, like what you see in this picture here. Okay, uh, and type four is kind of similar as well. Um, it's again a fairly fine mesh. Uh, but it's a little less three-dimensional, it's a bit more two-dimensional, it's more flat, okay? So, uh, again, with reticular fibers, we're dealing with a kind of collagen that is not very strong. It's not designed to withstand a lot of stress. Uh, instead, it forms this kind of a three-dimensional matrix on which cells can sit. Uh, the last kind of general category of fibers that we find in connective tissues are elastic fibers. Okay. And those are composed of elastin and fibrillin, and you can think of those as kind of the um, uh, you can think of them as kind of the spandex of your body. Okay, so um, you can think of collagen as kind of just 100% cotton. Okay, so if you buy a 100% cotton T-shirt um, and you stretch it, it remains stretched. Uh, but if you buy uh, a shirt that has like 3% or 5% um, elastane or, or spandex, what you find is that that, st that shirt will stretch, but more importantly, it will recoil back to its original shape. Okay, And so you can think of elastic fibers as kind of that sort, same sort of material, basically allowing the tissues that contain them to be more stretchy and to be able to recoil more easily, to regain their shape after they've been stretched. Okay, and so uh, in places where you do need to have a lot of stretch and, and recoil, especially, you will find a lot of elastic fibers. Okay. Now those are the fibers. Uh, there's also the ground substance, and the ground substance is composed of a molecule called high hyaluronic acid, uh, which is a very long polysaccharide. Uh, it's technically also a proteoglycan, but well, it's more of a chemistry sort of thing. It's basically a fairly poorly charged long molecule. Okay, so it's very very long chain basically. Okay, um, so you have the hyaluronic acid, which is one of the main components there, and then you also have things called proteoglycans. Okay, and proteoglycans, you can kind of try to picture them as one of these bottle brushes that you have in this picture here. Okay, so a bottle brush basically has kind of a an initial sort of straight rod or core and then from this core you have fibers kind of going off in different directions okay so you have fibers going off in different directions okay so these fibers are glycosaminoglycans okay and the core protein or proteoglycan, so the proteo part is that core, and glycan part is the glycosaminoglycans. Okay, so that's this part right here. So the little fibers, glycosaminoglycans, the core protein is the, the middle portion, the rod. Okay, now this is an interesting molecule because these glycosaminoglycans are highly sulfated. So they have lots of sulfates, which means that they are very highly negatively charged. Okay, 
Now, because of that charge, they're able to hold on to a lot of water. Okay, and so there's going to be a lot of water trapped in between these fibers, these glycosaminoglycans. Okay, now these proteoglycans can be in the form of one pro the protein core plus maybe one or two of these glycosaminoglycans attached to it or it can be a protein core with hundreds of these things attached kind of like this bottle brush that you're seeing in the image okay so again you could have this very highly dense sort of molecule and as you might imagine uh, the one that has very few glycosaminoglycans ants holds on to very little water the one ha that has lots of glycosaminoglycans ants holds on to a lot of water okay and this is important because water is going to be held by this ground substance and that is what's going to allow for easy diffusion of things right so if you want solutes to dissolve and diffuse they need to diffuse in a solvent that solvent is water Okay, and so the ground substance is the component that holds on to the water, which will allow for diffusion. Okay, and so this is one of the one of the reasons why it's so important to have this in the ECM of connective tissues is because there's going to be a lot of diffusion going from blood vessels to other tissues, uh, to various cells, uh, and back again from cells to uh, blood vessels as well. Okay, so that diffusion has to happen, and so in those places you're going to have lots and lots of proteoglycans. In places where you don't have a lot of diffusion happening, you probably can't, are not going to see a lot of proteoglycans in the ground substance, or ground substance in general. Okay, so uh, keep that in mind when you were looking at the different tissues, um, because uh, we will be seeing places where there's lots and lots of ground substance, like for example cartilage, and we'll also be seeing places where there's almost no ground substance at all, like for example bone. Okay, and again, both of those are connective tissues, and we'll be talking about those very soon in the coming weeks. Okay, so the next couple of slides, I just want to show you examples of what these things actually look like under the microscope. Um, by the way, uh, in terms of staining, when we're looking at ground substance, because it is so negatively charged, it's going to be very basophilic. And so ground substance is going to stain with hematoxylin. Whereas collagens, most of them will stain with eosin. And type 3 collagen is frequently stained with silver. It is described sometimes as being argio. as in silver loving, argeophilic, okay, whereas type 1 collagen, for example, would be eosinophilic, okay, so keep that in mind when you're looking at slides like this one, for example, all these fibers that you're seeing here, so these individual hair-like fibers that you're seeing in this section, okay, these are collagen fibers. Okay, so this is okay, so this is collagen. And specifically this is type 1 collagen. Type 1 collagen. Okay. Now you can see in this case is a very high magnification um, image. And so these fibers are actually very, very thin. Okay, so you can see individual thread-like fibers. These are thin Okay, and you can see for comparison Where's my cursor? I'm kind of having a hard time seeing it So oops right around here. Here's a nucleus. Okay, and so you can see these fibers are thinner than the nucleus of a nearby cell. Okay, let's let's keep it simple for now. Okay, so 
When you have thin fibers like this, we would refer to that as a loose connective tissue. Okay? When the fibers are very thick, when you have much thicker ropes of collagen, then we refer to it as a, a dense connective tissue. Okay? So let's just keep that categorization in mind. Okay? Now, on this next slide, you see these black fibers showing up here. So these black fibers that you're seeing here, you can see that they are highly branched. Okay, this is not type 1 collagen. Type 1 collagen is much more straight and very rope-like. This is highly branched and this is stained with silver. Okay, these are reticular fibers. So every time you're seeing this kind of a black sort of fiber that, that we're seeing on the slide, it's stained black because it was stained with silver. And so there's a reason why we're staining this slide with silver. We're trying to show you something that normally wouldn't show up with other stains. Okay? And so in this case here, this happens to be reticular fibers. And again, notice how much of a network we're seeing here, how much of a mesh. So basically, these fibers form a net on which a lot of these other cells are sitting okay so when you look at the slide there's lots of nuclei visible here okay on all these nuclei belong to cells that are sitting on this network they're kind of trapped within it I guess um, and they just basically sit there on this network um, this is taken from the spleen so basically it's a filtration system and so blood will flow past these cells and as it flows past these cells will be able to catch any pathogens that will be there within the bloodstream, okay? So again, this is a reticular fiber slide, so you can see reticular tissue here. And the last type of fiber that we wanted to look at is elastic fibers. Now what you're seeing here on this slide is a blood vessel. So here's the lumen, okay? So these little eosinophilic dots that you're seeing here inside the lumen are red blood cells. So if we have a lumen, then obviously there's going to be a, um, an epithelium. And again, so the blood vessel is going to be the endothelium. And that endothelium is right there, this very thin layer of cells. What I'm going to do now is I'm just going to zoom in on this so I can show you the actual fibers that we're interested in. So I'm going to zoom in on this area here. Okay. And so again, the endothelium, here's an endothelial cell, and you can see the nucleus is right here, here's another nucleus, here's another nucleus, these are endothelial cells, I want you to notice this here, here's a nucleus, there's a nucleus, there's a nucleus, all this is the endothelium. Down below this, let me just show that stuff in red. From here downwards, this is muscle. Okay? We won't worry about what kind for the time being, but it's it's basically muscle tissue. Okay. What I want you to notice next is between the muscle and the endothelium, there is a region that is very poorly staining. Okay, so just above this red line, and I'm going to put a, a blue line at the base of the endothelium. Hopefully you're noticing that there's a bit of a kind of a pale band showing up between the endothelium and the muscle. Okay, so again, this is the endothelium. Okay, so let's see. It's green here. This area right here. 
we have a very thick layer of elastic fibers. Okay, so we have elastic fibers there. Okay, now the reason that it didn't stain, the reason that it's not showing up is that elastic fibers do not take up hematoxin or eosin. Okay, so elastic fibers cannot be stained with hematoxin and eosin. You need a separate stain to show them. Okay, that separate stain, let me just zoom out maybe. Okay, so that separate stain is called Orsium. So let me just, I'll go back to the slide with this. So elastic fibers are stained with something called Orsium. So, so Orsian, if it's used, you will see them. If it's not used, you will not see them. Or you will see this kind of an empty space where those fibers would be. Okay. Now, the reason I say that they are thick, it's a thick layer of elastic fibers, is that um, you can actually see it as a fairly obvious band. Elastic fibers are normally very, very thin, so they wouldn't normally show up as this. Uh, and again, we'll talk later on this semester about blood vessels, and so you'll understand why this is so thick here. Uh, but for the time being, just understand that normally elastic fibers will be very thin, and if you want to see them, you need to be able to stain them with Orsian. Okay? Now, let's move on to cells. So, this is not an exhaustive list of cell types that are found within connective tissues. It's just a first list, just the first few for you guys to, to become familiar with. So in general, uh, when we're dealing with immature embryonic tissues, we're dealing with cells called mesenchyme cells, which form mesenchyme tissues. Okay, And these are stem cells. Uh, there's not really that much about these cells that's um, really easy to identify. Um, they have very little cytoplasm usually and they have fairly pale nuclei. The nuclei are pale because they don't really know which genes they need to turn off yet because they're stem cells. They could become any number of other things. Okay, and so including many of the cells that are listed in here. Okay? And many others. Okay, so let's um, move on and talk about the others. So the fibroblast is probably one of the more common cell types in your body. And this is the one that makes up uh, the collagen and ground substance. So this is the, the cell that is responsible for producing much of that extracellular matrix and also for maintaining it as well. Because again, once you've made a protein, that doesn't mean that protein is going to live forever. It's not going to last forever. Those proteins need to be maintained from time to time and need to be made fresh. And so fibroblasts will be doing this. Okay. Now, uh, macrophages are basically the vacuum cleaners of your body. Okay, these cells basically clean up things that don't belong. It's a phagocytic cell. It's non-specific, and it also tends to be involved with a lot of immune reactions. Okay, so your immune system tends to use macrophages as kind of one of the first places that first cells that might notice that something is wrong. Okay. Uh, now we have uh, cells also called mast cells that are fairly common in connective tissues. Uh, these are sometimes referred to as mastocytes. Uh, and again, they tend to be involved in kind of monitoring what's going on uh, and responding with an immune response uh, if they notice something that doesn't belong. Um, these are quite often involved in allergic reactions. Um, then you have cells called plasmacytes, which are differentiated B lymphocytes. Okay, so basically these are white blood cells that have differentiated, they have specialized, and they are producing antibodies. Okay? Uh, again, those are fairly common within connective tissues. Adipocytes are basically fat cells. And um, then we also have melanocytes, which are pigment cells. They produce, in our case, in humans, they produce melanin. which is the pigment that is responsible for giving you your eye color, your skin color, your hair color. So um, these are the cells that are responsible for doing this. 
Okay. Now I want you to notice um, kind of a pattern they're going to be seeing for the rest of the semester. Um, when you look at the ends of these names, many of them end in site. Okay, so we have cells that end in site. That basically just means cell. It means mature cell. Oops. Okay, and then the other thing that you may not have noticed as much is there's only one example of it here is blast. Okay, so let me just give you this as the other ending. Okay, so blast is the young or immature cell. Okay, in general, cells that start with what that end in blast are active okay and they're actively producing things and cells that end in sight are less active which will generally mean that their nuclei will be a little bit more dark staining uh, they may not have as many organelles in, in them. Uh, the, cell, the cytoplasm might be a little bit smaller. Okay. Now, what tends to happen is a blast, whatever cell you have that ends in blast, will eventually become a site. So, for example, uh, let me just go back to the previous list. An adipocyte started out as an adipoblast. Okay, so we had an adipoblast. which is just a young fat cell and that adipoblast over time accumulated lipid and became a mature adipocyte okay so again just start to notice these things if you notice them you start to get used to them it'll make your life easier as you go through this course okay so let's take a quick look at a, a few cell types in a bit more detail before we finish. So I mentioned macrophages are basically the, the vacuum cleaner of your, your body. They clean up things that don't belong. These are phagocytic cells. Um, and you can see them here as these very dark brown sort of cells. And the reason that you can see them is because they have phagocytized something. So they are full of these carbon particles. This is taken from a chest of a smoker. And so a lot of the stuff that this person has been breathing in over their lifetime has been cleaned up and removed from the system by the macrophages. Okay. Now macrophages, once they have engulfed something, if they cannot break it down, they become immobilized, so they stay there. And so again, more macrophages would have come into place to take up more of the particles as this person continued smoking they would have needed more and more macrophages to come in and remove more and more of this material. Okay. Now, there is a description here, um, but you're not going to see these under the microscope. Okay. Um, they look very much like fibroblasts. Okay. So when you're looking at a microscope slide um, that's just been H and E stained they won't look any different from fibroblasts so you're not going to be able to see them unless they have engulfed something so unless they engulf something if you can see that they have something in their cytoplasm like they see like you see here if you see that you know it's a macrophage otherwise you won't know you won't be able to tell okay so i'm unlikely to ask you to identify one of those on a slide next one mast cell okay uh, these are um, with a typical H and E preparation with hemotoxin and eosin, you will not be able to see them. Okay. However, if we want to see them, we actually can stain them with something called toluidine blue. Okay. So the stain called toluidine blue, which reacts with one of the components that these cells contain. Okay. So one of the things that these cells contain are granules, um, which have histamine and heparin. Okay. Heparin is a molecule which will convert toluidine blue 
to a different color. Okay, And so we refer to these granules as being metachromatic. Metachromatic means that it changes the color of the stain. So for example here, the stain was this slide was stained with toluidine blue, and so there would be some things that would be in blue. Uh, you can see that there's a lot of cells on here that don't really look like much. Have a lot of cells in here. There's a blood vessel here. Not very strongly stained. Uh, there's a lot of fibers in here as well. There's a lot of collagen, and so this collagen is showing up as kind of an orange color. And then you have a few cells in here that just kind of pop out. So you have one cell here, there's another cell over here that just really stick out. And that's just because they have converted the color of the stain to something that looks very different. Okay, they got they picked up this very purple color. Okay, so that tends to stick out. So that's what we're talking about, these metachromatic granules. So each of these that you're seeing here, these are cells. And again, they're showing up this intense because of that metachromasia, that, that heparin that's in the granules that is converting the toluidine blue stain into something a little bit different. Okay. And lastly, of these um, cells that are fairly easy to identify is a plasma cell. Okay, so plasma cell or sometimes referred to as a plasma site. Okay, so that's a mature form of the cell, which of course means that there was a plasma blast at some point, a less mature form of it. Okay, now plasma cells are fairly easy to identify because um, they are very, very actively producing antibodies. Now, antibodies are proteins that are being exported out of the cell, and so cells that are producing things for export have abundant rough ER. Rough ER is going to be used for exporting proteins and that means that the cytoplasm will look very basophilic and that's what you're seeing here and let me just kind of do this in blue and then these cells the cytoplasm in this cell is looking very very blue okay so all of this is very basophilic okay um, it's going to also have an eccentric nucleus, so the nucleus is off to one side, kind of pushed off to one side because the cytoplasm is taking up so much space. And the other thing to notice is that there's a prominent Golgi apparatus known as a negative Golgi image. It's negative because it doesn't take up any stain. Remember, lipids don't really stain very easily on slides. And so what we're seeing here is these areas next to the nucleus that look kind of empty. This is what we mean by a negative Golgi image. So we can see that in here as well. Okay, so all three of these are plasma cells. Okay, and just to convince you of what's going on inside there, let's take a look at an EM. And so we're seeing here is a nucleus. So here's the nucleus. And lots and lots of rough ER here. You can see all these lines. That's membranes. And they have little black spots all over them. Those are metal, those are um, those are the ribosomes, okay? And then there's this region in the middle here that contains lots of organelles, but those organelles will not stain with a typical stain. This is a negative Golgi image. Okay? So there you go, those are the cells and the ECM of connective tissues. We'll see you in the next video.